So, this is the BioCity of the future. You may wonder what's inside this little Petri, but let me tell you first a little bit more about the story of this idea. The, um, since I was a child, I always loved uh, reaching for high point and look, admire landscapes from above, and in particular, urban landscapes were among my favorite. I think they possess a form of naturalness, we can say, that is at odd with the idea of cities as being completely planned artificial systems. So, as I grew up, I began to discover more about science of complexity and complex systems, and I started to look at cities as complex systems. And I discovered that their metabolism is what counts, and perhaps the morphologies, the patterns that we see when we look at them from above, are very much the product of the flows of information, matter, and energy that fuels their metabolisms. So this notion gave me uh, the, the possibility to start looking at cities as living systems and to move away from the kind of notion of a city as a collection of building blocks separated by gaps, by voids. This idea was reinforced uh, in 2003 when I traveled to Caracas and I spent six months there doing a research. The city of Caracas is, is, is um, highly informal, we can say, is, is, is uh, developed through a, a, a form of urbanism and that it is very much at odd with the, with the kind of centralized planning logic that we used to study in, in school. And in particular, when I was there, I realized how strong is the interdependence of city centers with the territory that surrounds them in terms of these flows that are human flows, so cities and people moving, but also material flows, energetic flows. Uh, this process, I think, in the last 10 years has accelerated to an incredible extent. The image you can see behind me, they clearly show how deeply interconnected the world is today. And here we are looking again at, at material, information and energy flowing across from big cities to a, 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 a many, many uh, centers, uh, productive areas, extraction areas scattered around the globe. So today, I think I'd like to begin to introduce this idea of the urban sphere. So the idea that a city today covers the entire biosphere is made of this incredibly intricate network of connections. And sites like these, uh, landfills, mines, extraction sites, are very much part of these, or these urban spheres. And this is part of a, of a resource-driven industry that is necessary to the survival of our urbanizing society, but at the same time also represents perhaps the biggest threat to our ability to live here in this planet. So we can say that there is an urban sphere that is very much directly interacting with the biosphere at a global scale, and these two systems are almost impossible to distinguish at the moment. So my point became, is it possible or is it, would it be possible to redesign, reconceive this urban sphere to make it much more efficient, uh, resilient, and adaptive. Can we think of the urban sphere as a coevolutionary system with the biosphere, a system that is able to exchange with the biosphere and maintain a, a kind of sustainable symbiotic equilibrium? And this is where this little thing comes about. Um, this is a slime mold. It's, it's a really bizarre creature. Um, it's, it's a tiny creature, it's a very simple creature. In fact, uh, it's a protist, it's a single cell, it's made of a single cell. However, it's, it's a very unique kind of cell because inside there are thousands, if not millions, of nuclei floating, you can see in this little video, floating around in the, in the what uh, scientists call the protoplasmic fluid. And this is all kept together by the cell walls, which are made of actin. Uh, they, they operate like muscles and, and they contract and expand. But this contraction expansion is the product of thousands of local reactions. Each nuclei has the ability to react to the surrounding environment and 
through this uh, chemical reaction, trigger uh, changes in gradients of pressure, which in turn uh, create this, uh, this uh, deformation. So something which is extraordinary about this creature is that in doing so, it leaves traces in the environment. You can see them here in this picture. These traces constitute what scientists call distributed spatial uh, memory. So this is such a simple creature, it doesn't have a brain, nothing even close to it, but it is able to use the space, the environment, leaving traces in it, and use this, retrieve this as a form of memory. Through this mechanism, it can solve problems, even complex ones. It can optimize network, so it can minimize the energy expenditure to reach out for food. It can also balance the amount of nutrients uh, it takes from the environment, depending on their availability. And it can even predict changes in the environment. And what struck me the most was that these kind of tasks are precisely the one that urban systems and urban infrastructures try to do. And this is what we planners, architects, engineers are trying to optimize and to design every time. But the way this line mall does it is completely different. There is no planner there, there is no central brain. It all happens through what we call emergent collective intelligence, through a kind of bottom-up process embedded in the landscape, embedded in the environment. So we started to think, how can we harvest this logic? How can we apply this new way of operating to our cities? Well, to try to do that, we developed this, which is a kind of new type of design apparatus, urban design apparatus. And what this does, it takes data from the territory, from the largest scale territory we are working on, and feeds them to the slime mold and back again. So it creates a communication between this biological computer and the landscape. We run tests, this is a one case study in Arizona in the Copper Corridor. And what we did first was to begin to extract data, so using satellite models, this is a dam model, which enables us to reproduce the exact topographic conditions of the area, and we converted them into this 3D printed landscape that becomes a substratum for the slime mold to, to grow. We also looked and mapped very carefully at the availability of resources in the landscape, present and future ones, and those become the uh, amounts and positions for us to inject little amount of nutrients. So we created an analog between what happens or what may happen in the large territory and this little uh, uh, computing environment. And that's what came out. This one is exactly the one that I have in my hand. You can see the morphology uh, that we got at the end of the experiment, but you, you can also see these kind of nuances of color that if you zoom in with the lens, in fact, are really tiny little uh, uh, kind of patterns of connections of networks which uh, correspond to the distributed memory. What we were interested in, of course, was not just the final form, but was the behavior, the way the slime mold achieves that. And you can see in this little video, which is a time lapse uh, of, of the experiment, in which you have uh, 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 accelerations and scanning of the landscape and then moments of optimization. This process keeps going on and on, and as the environment changes, as in you introduce nutrients, you introduce new conditions in the environment, then new solutions are elaborated in real time. And this is all through this process of, uh, as we called, emergent collective intelligence. So we were very fascinated uh, from, this, uh, from this process, and we decided to try to uh, uh, not only observe it, but really capture it. So we developed a, a, a technique, a digital technique in this case. So we started to scan in real time and, and digitize the morphology of the slime mold as the experiment got along. And we tried to replicate the behavior of the nuclei through uh, virtual agents, like a swarm of virtual agents. And the same as the physical one, the virtual agents also leave little traces in the landscape as they move along. And, what we began to observe are these kind of emergent drawings that we found really beautiful and fascinating. And one of the characteristics, which is immediately apparent uh, as opposed to the urban drawings that we are used to, is the kind of fuzziness of, of them. These kind of edges are never defined, are never black and white, are always a kind of a gradient of, of, uh, of, uh, of conditions. And th this was really uh, uh, differentiate the system from ours. And as you zoom into this drawing, you can see there is uh, more and more levels of definition. You begin to see the interaction or the interference between natural systems like rivers in the landscape and these new uh, uh, kind of insertions. You also begin to discover 
points and moments of, of, of hardening, and this is where the, the most intense exchange between the urban sphere or the new biocity and the landscape happens. So as we were doing, as we were running this experiment, we started to think, what could be, in reality, uh, what could provide us for this uh, uh, direct ability of exchanges? What kind of architecture or urban uh, uh, typology may actually uh, 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 solve this, uh, this purpose? And this idea uh, somehow came about, I would say, almost by accident um, when we were, I mean, six years ago, more or less now, I was having a, a walk in the, in the park, actually near the canal in East London, and I just noticed that uh, in the canal there was this uh, kind of bubbling of oxygen coming out, and it was the product of these microalgae uh, that were kind of uh, overgrown on the edge of the canal. And I began to wonder, uh, th there is a kind of forgotten uh, landscape here uh, um, which we may be able to, to convert into a kind of larger uh, kind of oxygenating machine uh, for the city. And through these ideas, uh, I, I started to to develop and, and study more about the microalgae themselves. And as we normally do as architects, I started to develop prototypes. And this is one of them in which we actually just took the classical archetype of architecture, the column, and reimagine it as a kind of a living uh, a system, a wet, soft, dynamic system. And um, these, uh, for us, uh, really became the excuse to explore uh, more directly the properties of these microalgae. And we discovered that they are, in fact, incredible machines. They are 10 times more efficient than large trees in converting uh, CO2 in oxygen and in growing biomass. So we thought, okay, we may have just found a possible ingredient to turn urban spaces, public spaces, architectural uh, uh, typologies into this new kind of uh, uh, adaptive, productive uh, interface between the urban sphere and the, and the natural spheres. And this is, uh, this vision almost close to take shape uh, next year. Uh, this is a project we are developing for Expo in Milan, and it's an urban canopy. It's really about turning a piazza into an interactive, participatory, productive uh, landscape, urban landscape. And this uh, system, in particular, uh, is uh, um, actually developed through a membrane called ETFE. Uh, we were able to um, convert or to adapt this membrane to host uh, fluid. You can see this wetness uh, going through it. In, in, it contains nutrients, CO2 and the microalgae themselves. And this system is adaptive, a little bit the way we, we saw before with the flow of, of the slime mold. We can control the amount of flow and, and, and we can respond in real time to environmental changes. Let's say there is a very sunny day, algae will photosynthesize more, will grow, become darker, the system will become rest, less translucent and shade, uh, shade more. So in reality, the, the idea is that, okay, we have probably, we are probably on the way to begin to develop systems that have similar properties to the one uh, we observed before in the slime mold. And so for us, the last important question was, how can we connect these systems in a way that they can begin to operate together in quite like the way we saw before for the, for the, for the nuclei within the slime mold, utilize the space, the urban space, or uh, as a form of distributed collective intelligence. To test this idea, we developed another prototype. This was here in London in the Architectural Association. This is a kind of wet living, hanging ceiling. Uh, quite simply, uh, had a series of terminals you could directly interact with. You could feed the system with the CO2 coming from your lung, and you could be fed by it uh, just by sucking uh, the, the nutrients as they were growing inside. The system was photosynthetic, was active, was living. And you know, we learned how to capture the little flow of electron to generate energy. This is a, a test of a biocell uh, from it. But also, most importantly, the system was a portal to access another dimension. And this is where the power of the, of the internet, of the web, for us uh, became quite interesting. And we started to develop this idea uh, or this character of the cyber gardener. Uh, what is the cyber gardener? The cyber gardener is, 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 is you, is me, is all of us. If you want, whoever is interested in engaging in this new possibility of 
producing, harvesting, exchanging, storing energy in the urban environment as part of our daily uh, life. Obviously, some of us may become more involved in the, in the growing process, some of us in the exchanging process, but I have no doubt that in a few years' time, we will be exchanging quanta of energy the same way today we do with emails or tweets. And so this was really an attempt to, to say, okay, perhaps we can start designing virtual systems, uh, virtual landscapes where this form of spatial distributed memory can, can occur. This could become frameworks to begin to coordinate globally a movement uh, that finally completely redescribed, turns upside down the way the urban sphere works today and eventually turns it into something that is much more adapt to engage and exchange symbiotically with the biosphere. So, in conclusion, I think that the convergence of information and biological technologies uh, conjures the possibility of a new um, industrial revolution. So, I'm really talking about a paradigm shift here. Uh, industrial revolution that uh, turns the potential or emergent collective intelligence and begins to uh, grow the biocity of the future. Thanks.